I've received a request from Mr. Lukemeyer of Missouri to participate in today's hearing. Without objection, Mr. Lukemeyer, welcome. And as you all know, uh, Mr. Lukemeyer has an interesting banking background. Um, good morning. The hearing will come to order. I've already struck the gavel, so don't you love that when they give you the instructions? Compliance with federal regulations creates costs for all businesses, but those costs are particularly burdensome for small businesses. The burdens are higher because of small businesses do not have the capacity, compliance staff, the ability to do regulatory arbitrage as larger organizations do. For the past several years, it has been difficult for small businesses and financial institutions. Many have been forced to close their doors or merge with others. And many times, larger financial institutions have acquired those. For those institutions that have survived the regulatory burden, has required staff to spend more time on compliance than on helping customers. If this trend continues, banking customers and credit union members will have less choice when it comes to accessing financial services. Regulators can play an important role in preventing or, excuse me, in preserving the health of the financial service sector. They ensure that banks have sufficient resources to protect depositors and customers so they can continue to serve the needs of their communities. However, it is not aiding, it, however, it is not aiding layers of regulation that makes institutions safer. It is smaller regulation that does not arbitrarily add costs without adding benefits. Today we will hear from a distinguished panel of experts who will discuss the current regulatory burden and tell us what effects these rules are having on their businesses. And with that, I'd like to yield to Ms. Chu. Would you like to do the opening statement for the Democrats? No, or, or when Ms. Clark shows up, we'll, we'll roll that in. Um, on the side of this, um, in a previous life, I spent a lot of time on Dodd-Frank um, before being moved around on committees. And we've had this great question. I'm hoping actually um, we partially hear this from the panel of how much of it is preparing for the new regulatory environments, how much is actually complying with, how much is it just getting definitions and mechanics, and how much of it is also now coming from rule sets that may be being promulgated through the CFPB. And is the mechanics coming from that sort of a one-size-fits-all? So if you're a small regional credit union, is it appropriate to, in many ways, face some of the same rule sets that a money center uh, financial institution will face? Um, why don't we go into testimony? As all of you know, or hopefully know, five minutes each. Um, you'll see the um, clock light up. Um, when you see yellow, just talk faster. And um, let's see. Shall we just um, I'd like to introduce um, Ms. Pierce. Our first witness today is, is it Hester? Hester Pierce, Senior Research Fellow for the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where she focuses her work on financial regulation. Prior to joining the Mercatus Center, Hester worked for the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. She also serves as a staff attorney for the Securities Exchange Commission under Paul Atkins, and has a law degree from Yale, which we won't hold that against her. And Ms. Pierce, thank you for being here. You have five minutes. Share with the committee. Thank you, Chairman, and it's a real honor to be here today. I think this is a very important topic that we're talking about. It's important for all of us to have a financial system that's healthy, dynamic, and that has variety in it. Um, we all benefit from having a range of financial institutions, from the from the smallest ones to the to the largest ones. They they meet different types of consumers and small businesses and large businesses needs. Um, unfortunately, the regulatory scheme that we're putting in place and that we've been putting in place over a number of years and decades is is endangering this variety. And we're we're moving more towards a system where we're going to end up with. A, several very large financial institutions, and that is going to leave needs unmet, um, and small businesses and consumers will find it much harder to get their financial needs met. 
So today what I want to talk about is, is several ways in which this is happening. First, the regulatory system is just designed with large financial, system, financial institutions in mind. Um, second, the regulatory burdens just fall more heavily on small financial institutions. It's much more difficult for them to deal with the regulations coming out. And third, uh, the administrative procedures that are in place for agencies to take consequences of their actions into consideration, they're just not spending enough time um, and they're not taking those processes seriously enough. Small financial institutions serve a very important function in the community. They, they often serve rural communities and small businesses get a lot of their loans from small financial institutions, so they definitely fill a niche. And they do this through relationship lending, which is getting to know their, their consumers in the context of the local community and understanding what financial products and services they need. Unfortunately, the regulatory system is set up to not accommodate that relationship lending well. Instead, it's set up, um, for example, you can take the, the new Consumer Bureau, uh, which is, views financial products and services in a plain vanilla lens. And so for them, it's easy if they can deal with a large finance, financial institution that offers standardized products, and they can go in and they can say, okay, these are the terms that we want you to offer those products according to. Whereas for a smaller financial institution that's dealing with consumers and small businesses based on their individual uh, facts and circumstances, that, that standardized model doesn't work as well. Um, and just more generally, when financial regulators sit down to write regulations, they're thinking of the big multinational bank. They're not thinking of a small bank down, down the street from them. Um, and so what that means is that we end up with regulations that just work better for, for large institutions. So for example, when the U.S. regulators go over to Switzerland to write the capital regulations, they're not thinking of small banks, they're thinking of international banks. Then they come back to the U.S., they, they put the, the regs out and they realize, oh, this doesn't work as well for small financial institutions. And so they make some accommodations, but it's after the fact accommodations. Uh, and then another area is Dodd-Frank, um, created a new system of identifying the biggest and most systemically important uh, financial institutions. And in doing that, it's sending the message that the government stands behind these large financial institutions. The smaller financial institutions are left to fend for themselves. And, and so there's, there's definitely now an understanding in the country that there are certain financial institutions that the government is really concerned about making sure that they survive. And that's just not a healthy, um, it's not a healthy system. The other issue with regulation is that just dealing with the mass of regulations that comes down is much more burdensome for a small financial institution that can't afford to hire an army of consultants and lawyers and doesn't have a lot of regulatory staff. Um, and so it just becomes much more burdensome for them to sort through regulations and figure out um, what those regulations mean for them. And then finally, I'll just say that there are administrative processes that regulators can use to make better rules. One of these is using economic analysis. Unfortunately, financial regulators have shown themselves to be, to be uh, very loath to use economic analysis to try to figure out what the problem is, to look at different alternatives, and to look at the costs and benefits. And that would help them to identify unintended consequences of regulations. So I just want to thank you and, and just mention in closing that the Mercatus Center has done a survey on small banks. And the message that we're getting is loud and clear that the regulations are really an overwhelming burden for them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. I'd like now to introduce our second witness, um, Linda Sweet. Um, Ms. Sweet is President and CEO of Big Valley Federal Credit Union located in Sacramento, California. Linda has been with Big Valley for 40 years. Yes. Wow and president and CEO for 25. Big Valley Federal Credit Union was founded in 1953 and has 56 million in assets. Big Valley serves residents of Gold River, California, and employees of Safeway Grocery Stores, Pepsi, and Automo Automotive Aftermarket Services, Inc. Yes. Okay, one I'm not familiar with. Um, Ms. Sweet is testifying on behalf of National Federal Credit Union. Thank you for being here. You have five minutes. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Swikert, Ranking Member Clark, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Linda Sweet, and I am testifying this morning on behalf of the National Association of Federal Credit Unions. I serve as President and CEO of the Big Valley Federal Credit Union in Sacramento, California. NAVQ and the entire credit union community appreciate the opportunity to discuss the regulatory burden credit unions face. The overwhelming tidal wave of new regulations in recent years is having a profound impact on credit unions and their 97 million members. Credit unions are some of the most highly regulated of all financial institutions, facing restrictions on who they can serve and their ability to raise capital. There are many consumer protections already built into the Federal Credit Union Act. This is why during the debate on Wall Street reform, NAVQ opposed credit unions being included under the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Rulemaking Authority. We are still concerned about this today. Unfortunately, while credit unions did not cause the financial crisis and actually helped blunt the crisis by continuing to make loans, they are still firmly within the regulatory reach of the Dodd-Frank Act. The impact of this growing compliance burden is demonstrated in the declining number of credit unions, dropping by more than 800 institutions since 2009 a main reason for this decline is increasing costs and complexity of regulatory compliance. Many smaller institutions simply cannot keep up. A 2012 NAVQ survey of our members found that 94% of respondents had seen their compliance burdens increase since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. A 2013 survey found that over 70% of respondents have had non-compliant staff members take on compliance-related duties, thus not serving members. At my credit union, I have seen our compliance costs skyrocket. These increased costs have resulted in the inability to provide the quality of service our members expect. Now we are often slower to offer services and, are, and there are some that we have, are forced to cut back. In order to truly comply with a rule, a credit union employee must read the regulation in its entirety, interpret the law and its intent, write or rewrite the credit union's policy and procedures, and identify which supervisor is assigned the responsibility for monitoring, complying, and reporting back to management on the necessary information. Keep in mind that this is required by each regulation. For most small credit unions, a single employee may be the only ha handling regulatory compliance. Mega banks have entire teams dedicated to compliance. NAVQ has called on Congress in a five-point plan to provide broad-based regulatory relief to help credit unions of all sizes especially smaller credit unions like mine. A number of provisions in this plan have been introduced as part of the Regulatory Relief for Credit Union Act, introduced by Representative Gary Miller. We urge the subcommittee members to support this legislation. In conclusion, the overwhelming tidal wave of new rules and regulations has hampered the ability of credit unions to serve their members and relief should be extended to the entire industry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Sweet. Um, our next and our third witness um, is Mr. Doyle Mitchell, Jr., President and CEO of Industrial Bank, located here in Washington, D.C. And actually, it's just off script. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, uh, I've come across your name in a number of articles. Um, Industrial Bank was founded by M Mr. Mitchell's grandfather in 1934 and, and is currently the sixth largest African-American-owned bank in the country with $370 million in assets. Mr. Mitchell has worked at Industrial Bank since 1994. 
Mr. Mitchell is testifying on behalf of the Independent Community Bankers of America. Thank you for joining us today. You have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Swiker, and good morning. Um, uh, also, Ranking Member Clark and members of the subcommittee, my name is B. Doyle Mitchell, Jr., and I'm President and CEO of Industrial Bank. As you indicated, we are located in Washington, D.C., founded in 1934 at the height of the Great Depression by my grandfather. We are the oldest and largest African-American commercial loan bank in, in the Washington metropolitan area. We employ over 120 individuals. And today I do testify uh, uh, on behalf of 7,000 community banks represented by the Independent Community Bankers of America. So I do thank you for convening this hearing. In addition to being a member of ICBA, I'm also the chairman of the National Bankers Association. That's a trade association for the nation's minority and women-owned banks. There's an important segment of community banks like mine that were founded to serve minority communities in historically underserved areas, often ignored by other institutions. In order to reach their full potential as catalysts for entrepreneurship, economic growth, and most importantly, job creation, community banks must have regulation that's calibrated to our size, our lower risk profile, and our traditional business model. ICBA has developed its plan for prosperity, a platform of legislative recommendations that will provide meaningful relief for community banks. The plan for prosperity is attached to my written testimony in addition to a list of the 23 bills that have been introduced in the House and the Senate that incorporate plan provisions. <coughs> I would like to use this opportunity to highlight the single bill that captures, that best captures the full scope of the plan. That's the Clear Relief Act, H.R. 1750, introduced by Representative Blaine Lukemeyer, a former community banker and member of this committee, as well as the Financial Services Committee. 1750 has almost 90 co-sponsors with strong bipartisan representation. A Senate companion bill has similar bipartisan support. Key provisions of 1750 would provide relief from new mortgage rules that threaten to upend the economics of community bank mortgage lending, which we do, and drive further industry consolidation. Specifically, 1750 recognizes the overriding incentive of a lender to ensure that loans held in portfolio with full credit risk uh, exposure are well underwritten and affordable. Under 1750, a community bank loan held in portfolio would be granted qualified mortgage status, or QM as, they, as it's called, which shields the lender from heightened liability exposure under the CFPB's new ability to repay rules. If my bank holds a loan in portfolio, it's in our best interest to ensure that the borrower has the ability to repay. Withholding QM status for loans held in portfolio and exposing the lender to litigation risk will not make loans safer, nor will it make underwriting more conservative. It will merely detour community banks from making such loans and curb access to credit. By the same token, 1750 would exempt community banks bank loans held in portfolio from new escrow requirements for higher price mortgages. Again, portfolio lenders have every incentive to protect their collateral by ensuring the borrowers make tax and insurance payments. For low volume lenders in particular, an escrow requirement is expensive and impractical. And again, it will detour lending to borrowers who have no other options. Another provision of 1750 will raise the threshold for C uh, for the CFPB's small servicer exemption from 5,000 to 20,000 loans. Community banks have a strong personalized servicing record and no record of abusive practices. To put the 20,000 threshold in perspective, consider that the five largest servicers have an average portfolio of over 6.8 million loans. Other provisions of 1750 will provide relief from unworkable new appraisal requirements, Sarbane-Oxley internal control attestation, redundant privacy notices, and other expensive requirements intended for large, co complex banks. 1750 provides strong, clear legislative response to the threat of mistargeted regulation to the community banking charter without compromising safety and soundness or vital consumer protections. I encourage you to reach out to the bankers and community bankers in your districts and ask them whether 1750 would help them better serve their community. Your co-sponsorship would be greatly appreciated by community banks and ICBA. Thank you again for the 
opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Um, and there's always that request for that co-sponsorship, isn't there? <laughs> um, I would actually like to hand the mic over to Ranking Member Clark um, to do her opening statement and introduce her witness. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the members of the panel for being here with us this morning. And I think it's prudent to take a moment to remember why Dodd-Frank was implemented in the first place. For those who might be experiencing selective amnesia, five years ago, widespread malfeasance brought our nation to the brink of fi financial collapse. We're not in it for swift congressional action on behalf of the American people, were it not for uh, swift congressional action on behalf of the American people, would be living in a very different America today. And the American people have overwhelmingly supported this action. According to a survey conducted by the Center for Responsible Lending, 83% of those surveyed, including 75% of Republicans, favor tougher regulation for financial institutions. Dodd-Frank has been a lightning rod for critics and supporters alike throughout its debate and even as it has stood as the, as the law of the land for the past three years. The Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, excuse me, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an agency whose responsibility it is to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, and abusive financial products, was created by Title X of Dodd-Frank and remains one of the provisions under the most scrutiny. Since beginning operations, the CFPB has secured more than $750 million to million dollars of consumers who were subjected to deceptive practices, imposed penalties on companies to deter future activity, and warned others to clean up their deceptive practices. While the CFPB's primary responsibility is to regulate financial products, it is clear that small financial institutions were not the cause, and I repeat, were not the cause of the race, recent financial calamity. Small businesses use these products as well in the form of personal credit cards and home equity loans to finance their businesses. Therefore, it is important that the CFPB balance the need to regulate abusive practices without adversely affecting the credit market for small businesses. Understanding that financial institutions were not the cause of the financial crisis, Congress took steps to shield small community banks, merchants, retailers from the extreme and extra scrutiny by the CFPB. Additionally, the CFPB must conduct small business advisory review panels, becoming only the third agency to be required to do so. These protections were, not, were put in place with the small business community in mind and to ensure that the engines of our national economy will be able to power us to a full recovery without undue burden. The CFPB is vitally important to improving the integrity of our financial apparatus, and it is important that the CFPB ensure its integrity while ensuring that the small business community is allowed to thrive with little interruption. Today, as we've heard, experts and stakeholders are, are looking at the state of the CB, CFPB's regulatory activities. I want to again thank each and every one of you for coming and lending your expertise uh, today's uh, discussion. And I'd like to take this opportunity now to introduce to everyone Professor Leviton. It is my pleasure to introduce Adam Leviton. Mr. Leviton is a professor at the Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C., where he teaches courses on bankruptcy, commercial law, and, commercial and consumer finance. He has previously served as a scholar in residence at the American Bankruptcy Institute and as a special counsel to the Congressional Oversight Panel supervising TARP. Before joining the Georgetown faculty, Professor Leviton practiced law at Whale, Gottschall, and, Ma and Mangas and served as a law clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Third Circuit. Professor Leviton holds a JD from Harvard Law School and degrees from Columbia University and Harvard College. I'd like to welcome Professor Leviton. Five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Schweikert, Ranking Member Clark, members of the committee, and Representative Lukemeyer. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I want to emphasize that I'm testifying today solely as an academic, not as a member of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Consumer Advisory Board or on behalf of the CFPB. Uh, there's been lots of new financial regulation since 2008, and not all of it is perfect. But 
a lot of it, much of it, was long overdue, especially for mortgages, credit cards, and bank capital regulation. The implementation of this new regulation is still in process, and I think that mean, makes it really too early to judge the regulation at this point. That said, I think, I think it's possible to, to uh, offer some early observations. First, there obviously are some compliance costs with new, with new regulation, and these costs are going to be harder for small businesses to amortize over their operations than for, than for large banks. Um, but it's important that we remember to weigh, the, uh, weigh the, the compliance costs against regulatory benefits, and those benefits include uh, more transparent and efficient markets, and more transparent and efficient markets can result in cheaper capital for small businesses of all sorts, and for greater spending power for consumers who are the customers of small businesses. Um, it's also hard to see the new regulations materially affecting the competitive landscape. We, we hear quite a bit about increased compliance costs for small businesses, and I don't doubt that, uh, small financial institutions, and I don't doubt that for a second, but I would note that we have no hard data about the actual extent of the changes in compliance costs. And I think that's an important thing that we would want to know before proceeding with any changes in regulation. And uh, particularly because some of the regulations actually help level the playing field between large institutions and small institutions. Right now, large financial institutions uh, have a major advantage in the, in the financial services marketplace. In part, this is because they have this too big to fail benefit that they're understood as being uh, guaranteed implicitly by the United States government. And I don't think that's a function of Dodd-Frank in any way. That's a function of that we're never going, that uh, neither this Congress nor any other Congress is ever going to let the financial system collapse. This is just a reality we have to work with. Um, but we can try and, and level the playing field between small institutions and large institutions. And some of the recent regulations actually have that effect. Of the recent regulations, like the Credit Card Act, Dodd-Frank Act, um, and the, the new capital requirements uh, uh, under Basel III, they actually put most of their burden on, lar on big banks. And this makes sense because while we have around 14,000 depositories and credit unions in the United States, we, you know, most of the, assets in, this, uh, most of the uh, assets in the financial services space are controlled by about 100 banks. So we have lots of very, very small financial institutions but most of, the, most of the action is happening wi with large banks. These small banks play a very important role in their communities, and particularly as sources of small business credit, but it's important not to lose sight of the, the big picture on them. So let me just take you through a few the, the impact of a few of the, the recent regulations. The Credit Card Act of 2009, well, 85% of credit cards are issued by 10 banks. Most banks don't issue credit cards. Only about half of credit unions issue credit cards of any sort. So it, most of the regulatory burden of the Credit Card Act is falling on a very small number of banks. The Durbin Amendment to the Dodd-Frank Dodd Act dealing with interchange fees on debit cards only applies to, or the key provision of the Durbin Amendment only applies to banks with over $10 billion in assets at the holding company level. That's uh, just over 100 banks. Most banks are not subject to the key provision of the Durbin Amendment. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has examination authority only over the largest banks in the country, only over about 100 banks, again, banks with over 10 billion in assets. Smaller financial institutions, be they banks or community banks or credit unions, continue to be examined by their regular, by their, their regular prudential um, examiners. And the CFPB has actually been very solicitous about uh, taking care of small banks and understanding that there are real uh, con special concerns there. So for example, the qualified mortgage rulemaking that is an accept, uh, creates a safe harbor for the Dodd-Frank ability to repay uh, rule. It has uh, several carve-outs for smaller financial institutions, and the result of this is that at least in the current market, about 95% of mortgages are estimated, uh, mortgages that are being made today would comply with the QM requirement. Similarly, the Basel III capital requirements, 95% um, of financial institutions already comply with those according to the FDIC. So all in all, I think it's too early to judge the effect of recent financial regulatory reforms, but at least at first glance, I think there's good reason to think that the, the costs do not outweigh the benefits, and I think we should, we should uh, you know, wait and see until we have more information before trying to change the regulatory uh, scheme that we have in place now. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'm going to actually go to Mr. Rice first, um, then back to the ranking member, because I actually have a, um, a whole diatribe of questions. So, um, Mr. Rice, five minutes. Get my glasses here. Professor uh, Leviton, does Dodd Frank solve the problem that caused the financial collapse? Um, the, we, we, uh, I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure we'd agree on what the problem on what the problem is. Um, I, I think that there are kind of two problems that 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 are key, and I think Dodd Frank goes a long way to addressing them, but maybe doesn't do everything. The two key problems were one, just too much leverage in the financial system as a whole, and secondly, the spark that kind of that's the powder keg, and then the spark that that lit it wa was on was with mortgages. Dodd Frank, I think, solves the mortgage problem. That uh, the, the ability to repay requirement in Title 14 of Dodd-Frank, it means that we really should not see mortgages as a systemic problem in the future. And, and, and that, when does that take effect? That, that takes effect, uh, the ability to, uh, in January 2014, I believe, is the effective date. So I think January 22nd, maybe? Yeah. Mr. Mitchell, that, that requirement that he's speaking of, this mortgage requirement, where all mortgages have these, you know, under this microscope, uh, how is that going to affect your lending practices? Uh, actually, it, it, it will probably decrease, it will decrease the amount of mortgages that we that we'll make. Uh, we hold some mortgages in portfolio. It takes away a lot of flexibility of mortgage banks to, um, to look at individual circumstances and we have to we have to strictly uh, uh, standardize. If you don't have, if you have a 44 percent debt to income ratio and not a 43 De uh, percent debt to income ratio, then then we won't make the loan, and there will be a lot of people that will not get home mortgage financing. Okay, so so you're saying that that a loan that you would have made prior to this new regulation taking into effect, you will no longer make. Quite a few, yes. Mm -hmm. And and what people, what what borrowers are affected by that? Is this the wealthy people that are affected by that, or is this the no, middle sir. income people? No, sir. Uh, it, it, it's probably lower uh, 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 middle income and low and moderate uh, income individuals. So what you're doing is you're preventing access to capital to lower and middle income. There's no question about it. And the, the end effect is that uh, it will have a negative effect on the housing, the, the rebounding housing market itself. Mm -hmm. How's this going to affect, how's Dodd-Frank going to affect your business lending? Um, well, you know, Dodd Frank, all in all, has added quite a few costs uh, to 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 our to our bank, and and particularly in man hours, uh, we we haven't had necessarily to hire more individuals. Although you, you do spend more more money on consultants to help you decipher uh, all the the new the new regulations, uh, but the man hours is 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 gone through the roof, and that that's a lot of time. Uh, not spent with our clients, our small business clients and our retail clients. Mrs. Sweet, I want to ask you the same questions I asked him. Uh, uh, this new mortgage requirement, uh, how is this going to affect your day-to-day -day lending? Um, there, it is the same as what he is speaking of. We um, have done mortgages for probably 25 years. Um, our membership is used to us where we know them. We are able to provide all of those loans and services to them. Under this new rule, we are going to be passing most of our loans to a third party. Um, we have started doing that, and the feedback that we're getting is why can't we stay with you? Our fees were much lower on our last home loan, um, and we don't have the loan with you any longer. That becomes an issue for us. It's a difficult situation to put our membership in. To put the consumer into another mortgage lender is very difficult. It, it did, did you portfolio loans? Did you keep loans? We did. And we, did you keep that more for the higher income people or for more for the lower income people? I would say both. A, a little of both. Have, we have sold loans about 10 years ago, but we portfolioed most of them. Under the new act, it's difficult because um, the debt-to-income ratio, we were very 
um, much able to look at the member individually under this the set of, of rules are very specific okay is this going to hurt more people borrowing if they're high income people or low income people if they're low income people so so there's going to be more competition for the high income high net worth borrower and the low income people are going to be shut out by this law yes in fact um as a good example we could have done a mortgage loan around three hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage loan and in california that's reasonable um for about twenty five hundred dollars in fees and costs and that included everything but i'm confused i thought we were trying to protect the middle class here um, thank you very much Ms. sweet my sure. time has expired Th thank you mr rice um ranking member clark Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, yield to uh, Ms. Chu at this time. Ms. Chu. Thank you so much. Um, the, um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is one of the few agencies that's required to conduct small business review panels. And so, Professor Levitin, in your testimony, you stated that, uh, that CFPB's outreach to smaller financial institutions is particularly important. How did CFPB engage with these small entities as it was formulating these new mortgage disclosure regulations? Well, I can't speak for, uh, I, I want to emphasize I'm speaking on only my own behalf. I, I, I don't know the full extent of the agency's contact with small institutions, but what I've seen when the CFPB has uh, advisory board meetings um, in various locations, um, CF, its top CFPB staff attends these, uh, these meetings. And they make a point when they're in places like Jackson, Mississippi, or St. Louis, Missouri, to go and meet with the local bankers to, uh, they, uh, on, their, uh, on their own time. They, they, uh, they make a point that they're going to have breakfast with the community bankers and the credit unions in that, in that area and talk face-to-face, -face, the officers of these, uh, these financial institutions, with the very top leadership of the CFPB, not intermediated by any trade associations and find out what are, what are their concerns, and they're listening to them, that, uh, that when they come back from these meetings and they're talking with the advisory board, it's very clear that they're, they've been listening and they're, they're very, uh, they, want, they want to understand what the concerns are of, the small, of small financial institutions. It's not that they're going to agree with them every, at every, time, every point, but they're going to listen to them. And the, this is, uh, the CFPB sees small financial institutions as really being very important within the U.S. financial system. In fact, uh, let's talk specifically uh, about the qualified mortgage rule uh, that was made earlier this year. Uh, the CFPB has created four different pathways for a mortgage to qualify uh, to gain this, this QM status. Uh, can you talk about these four pathways, including the small creditor definition and how they result in a broad qualified mortgage definition? Was the CFPB required to create a small creditor definition? Absolutely not. The, C the CFPB was directed by Congress to, um, on a fixed timetable, to adopt re uh, regulations implementing the statutory ability to repay requirement. The CFPB, in its implementing regulation, uh, this, this QM regulation, um, adopt, uh, included a safe harbor for small financial institutions that um, have no more than $2 billion of assets, and that's actually not that small of an institution, and uh, originate no more than 500 first lien mortgage loans in a year. They also, there's also now, um, more recently, this October, the CFPB added another exception, um, a time-limited exception for, uh, for balloon mortgages that applies to all, I believe, all small, um, can't remember the, the exact scope of who it applies to, but it, it's for smaller financial institutions on a broader definition, giving them two years to, to tran uh, more transition time for balloon mortgages. Um, in fact, uh, the Bureau estimates that more than 95% of the mortgage loans being made in the current market will be qualified mortgages. What is your opinion about how the market will react given that 95% of mortgages would be considered qualified mortgages as of January 2014? I think that there's been a lot of unnecessary panic in the market about QM. Um, that, as you stated, I mean, both the, the Bureau's estimate and Pri uh, private estimates such as Mark Zandi of Economy.com, who was one of uh, Senator McCain's uh, campaign advisors in 2008, um, they estimate that 95% of mortgages being originated today would qualify as QM. If that's correct, 
I don't think we're going to see that uh, very much of a change in the availability of credit in the market. And let me emphasize, it's possible, it's possible to make a mortgage loan that's not QM. It's not illegal. All that, uh, there, actually the penalty for having a non-QM loan is very, very limited. It's a, it creates a limited defense in a foreclosure that can, uh, it's not a defense to foreclosure, instead it creates a set-off right in foreclosure. And it's a set-off right that may actually only be for about $1,000, depending on how one interprets the statute. It may also include legal fees. Uh, a moment ago, you referred to this two-year transition um, for balloon loans to gain qualified mortgage <coughs> status. Uh, was the CFPB required to put in place this two-year transition period? No. This was something that the CFPB had, uh, did on its own volition because the CFPB was concerned about the effect of the um, ability to repay requirement on small financial institutions. It hasn't given small financial institutions everything that they've wanted, but the CFPB has, been, has really been thinking about where uh, the needs of small financial institutions and trying to be accommodating to small financial institutions while still being faithful to its legal duty to implement the statute as Congress wrote it. Okay, thank you. I see my time has come back, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Uh, Mr. Lukemeyer. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this morning in the uh, Wall Street Journal, a uh, story below the fold, a uh, tally of U.S. banks sinks to record low. And uh, it's a great article that uh, talks about the number of small banks uh, that have gone down now to below 7,000 in this country. Uh, talks about um, the one bank in the last three years that's actually had a new charter. Uh, otherwise, all new charters have basically stopped as a result of, uh, in, the, in, in this uh, article, it talks about the regulatory burden that a lot of small institutions are facing uh, one example was United Southern Bank of Kentucky that uh, had to hire 15 different people uh, while basically maintaining its same size just to be able to comply with the extra cost. And um, as a result of that, it's uh, interesting to hear some of the comments this morning. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Mitchell, I appreciate you being here. Uh, I noticed in your testimony also you mentioned the FDIC study that came out last fall. And in that study, it talked about banks under $100 million probably would not be able to survive any longer because of the increased cost, uh, un being unable to spread it out. I think Mr. Levitin and, and Ms. Sweet and Ms. Pierce, Pierce all made that comment, un unable to spread those costs out over a smaller uh, amount of uh, other people. So uh, can you talk just a little bit this morning about the amount of costs that you mentioned a while ago? You didn't hire any people, but you did have a percentage of cost, number of hours that it cost you to, to comply? Well, let, let me let me first of all say that three hundred and sixty, three hundred seventy million dollars in total assets. Um, I'm I'm having a lot of conversations with a number of my peers that are also feeling that 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 at our size we may be too small uh, to to survive, and so there's a lot of merger and acquisition conversation going on among institutions our size, not just at the, the hundred million dollar and, and, and lower uh, thresholds. Um, our cost is probably measured in man hours, and I don't have exact figures in that. I do know it's over 200 man hours that we have spent probably this year, additional man hours on compliance and, and coming up to speed with new compliance regulations and, and so forth. And, and um, you know, every time uh, we don't rely just on ourselves, we rely on consultants and so forth. Uh, so so the, the pressure on, the pressure on, on revenues and, and projecting for next year and, and the increase in man hours just takes away an inordinate amount of time from what we would really like to be doing. You know, the uh, title of the hearing today is uh, Regulatory Landscape Burdens on Small Financial Institutions. And I know there's been some discussion already about the QM situation, but there's something that hasn't been discussed about that yet, and that's the liability exposure that if you make the loan or if you don't make the loan, uh, I know that Mr. Levinton has made the comment a while ago that 95 percent of the loans are possibly going to be made. In our uh, full cert in the Financial Services Committee uh, a couple months ago, that number was 50 percent of the loans will be made. And I think that's probably closer if you talk to the, to the small banks of this country about the effect of QM and what it's going to be because, not only because of the rules and the way it's structured, but because of the liability exposure. 
will you make or will you not make that loan? Can you talk a little bit about the, the liability exposure that you look at and you see in, with the QM situation in making loans? Most community banks, uh, until they're absolutely sure, and that takes a team of lawyers to be able to tell you as for a certainty what your liability exposure is going to be, uh, are not going to make those loans until we're absolutely certain exactly exactly uh, what the exposure is. We, uh, we would just tend to stay away from it. Uh, that's why it makes sense to extend uh, the review period uh, before it's implemented so everybody can understand exactly what it is. I, I, I question that 95% of the loans are going to be made, and in particular, we serve underserved markets, and I can assure you that number is going to be much lower in underserved markets. Well, again, that number was given in testimony in, in the Financial Service Committee a couple months ago. So it's not my number. It's somebody else's yes. number who came to the committee. So yes. um, just another quick comment um, with regards to um, uh, I know you're a small business with 370 employees. and uh, 120. 120. Excuse me, 120. You've got 370 billion or million in assets. There we go. Uh, you know, the health care plan, Obamacare, is still a concern even for you. Uh, is that what are you doing to implement that? Is how's that costing out uh, your your uh, your program? Well, from what I was told, um, from what I was told by our HR department, it does not affect us right now. I think we're over the we're over the uh, the threshold of empl- number of employees limit. Okay, you you have your own. Are you self insured? Yeah, uh, no, we're not self insured, but okay. we do we do offer health care benefits to our employees. Okay, all right. Well, I've got some other questions with regards to that, but I, it. I think it's important to, to understand that, um, you know, you're dealing in an environment in which you are not the problem as a small business, as a small yes. uh, bank. You're not part of – you're not systemically important, although you're important to the community that you're in. Yes. You are not systemically important uh, from the standpoint of the overall financial risk to the, the whole system, yet you now are part of the solution, which you fall under these rules and regulations. And it's a little frustrating to me to see that the CFPB – uh, is making some rules and regulations. They had a group of, of uh, bankers come to my office uh, about a month or two ago, and they had been to the CFPB to talk about rules and regulations, and they were the 42nd group. This is the CFPB told them they were the 42nd group to be there to complain about these rules and regulations, and yet nothing's being done, and they're not listened to. So uh, it's disappointing to hear that from them. Hopefully CFPB will get on board and appreciate your testimony this morning. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lukemeyer. Um, Ranking Member Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Mitchell, as I stated in my opening statement, Dodd-Frank was necessary because we came to the verge of a complete economic collapse three years ago. That said, very few things in this world are perfect, especially legislation. There are always unintended consequences, including Uh, federal regulations upon uh, introduction. However, federal regulations can be tweaked and improved to adjust for these imperfections. What would you recommend as uh, as a perfecting tweak? And if there was a potential, there was a potential small business institution carve out, what would you suggest? Or is it your opinion that we should return to the deregulated era that caused the financial collapse? Well, I, I think we, we're on the page. We're on the same page in, in many respects. Uh, however, even I've been in I've been in the banking uh, industry since 1984. I've been president for 20 years, and even before Dodd Frank, you you had bankers in our industry complaining that there was already too much regulation, particularly on community banks. Uh, while Dodd Frank may have uh, been targeted uh, um, um, towards large banks, it is actually applies to all of us. And uh, that's the difficulty and the frustration that community banks, and particularly minority banks, uh, uh, share. Um, my tweak would be that, uh, that that community banks should be exempt from Dodd Frank uh, overall. Um, in, in particular, if there is, is there, if there's another opportunity, then I think uh, HR 1750 is a great start. Let me open that question to the rest of the panel and, and get your. Um, your take on it, uh, Professor Levitin, Ms. Sweet, Ms. Pierce. Um, again, I think it's a little too early. It's a little too early to tell that you know. I I do not. I I agree with you. We you know we can't assume that legislation's perfect, but uh, you know we had these legi- these uh, the uh, the implementing regulations for Dodd Frank. Many of them have not even gone into effect yet. It's just too early to tell what the effects are going to be. That um, I want to, you know, address the, in particular that 50% number that Mr. Luke Kemeyer cited. 
Um, that comes out of, from CoreLogic, and they were basing that on 2011 um, uh, origi mortgage origination activity. Most of that, a lot of that activity in 2011 wouldn't have qualified for QM because it was streamlined ref uh, refinancings, in other words, with, without full documentation. That's a cheap thing, a relatively cheap thing to fix. It's not, it was not about um, debt-to-income ratios. Uh, if you uh, fee keep uh, carve out, even in 2011, the streamlined refinancings, you get up to around 75% of 2011. The markets shifted again into in, in the 95% numbers based on what's going on in 2012, 2013. But um, I think, again, it's just too early to be, uh, to be, you know, stepping away from regulatory implementations that we don't even know what their effect is. Ms. Sweet, do you agree that uh, it's too early to step away and we don't know what the effect would be, particularly for small institutions? I think we've already felt an enormous amount of effect from um, the regulation. And I don't think it's too soon to tell. Um, we also do not have the funds, the resources, um, the budget to um, make sure whether we comply with the regulation um, or not. So it takes an enormous amount of my time away from our members, uh, especially the ones that are underserved, the ones who are confused and scared and need me. Uh, often I'm behind closed doors trying to read piles of regulations to see if, in fact, we are exempt or if we're not, what is necessary to comply with that regulation. The cost also that we um, do hire consultants for these regulations, it is impossible to know specifically um, all the answers once I read them. Um, we hire attorney for their opinions. And who is hurt is our members. And I know that was the reason for the regulation, was to protect. And I, I do understand why many of these regulations were put into place, to protect the underserved or protect the person who has no idea. And they're signing contracts. They don't know what they're doing. And it's very important to have those regulations. However, when you see um, or an organization such as credit unions that have never had those kinds of problems, it just seems so unnecessary to spend that kind of money and put it toward the regulation when it could be put toward the minority groups, to the underserved, to the immigration um, groups that are in California. And I can give you an example um, just a few weeks ago, and I believe part of the underserved is the senior citizens. They are afraid, are they going to lose their medical care? Is their Social Security going to be decreased? Can they survive? And often they have one of their family members that are ill, that they're trying to deal with an enormous amount of problems. I see that they do need us as an entity that they've trusted for 40, 50 years, and um, as I said a few weeks ago, um, a lady came into our office saying, I have one of your members, I've driven her here, she needs your help, someone took all of her money. I went. At, my staff went to the car, pulled me up a history of the account, and in six months her whole account had been drained. I, I looked through that history and found through an investigation that her, she put her granddaughter on with the agreement that her granddaughter would drive her car to help her to doctor's appointments, use her ATM card for doctor appointment costs, and for food. Her daughter took, granddaughter took all of that. The car, we saw hotel bills, pizza parlors, an excessive amount of costs. $11,000 was drained from her account, and she was on Social Security. Um, had I not had the time to spend with her in the car, this could not have been even noticed. And that is a bit of the underserved. It's not just the minority groups. It's, it's often seniors who have nowhere else to turn. And... Luckily, and the end of that story is, 
They we turned it over to the elder financial abuse department. They found the car. Um, we closed the ATM card, and we have helped the woman to a positive result. Ms. Pierce, did you want to want to add anything to what has been said? Yeah, well, I think that Ms. Sweet and Mr. Mitchell tell the story very powerfully, but I do think that we should reopen Dodd-Frank because while the intentions were good, the philosophy behind it is is bad. It's taking away lending decisions from local institutions that know their customers and giving it to folks at the CFPB whose intentions are good but who don't know the circumstances on the ground. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to ask just one more question. Um, Professor Levitin, uh, considering the hundreds of smaller banks that have failed since the near collapse five years ago, do you believe that Basel III capital requirements are sufficient to prevent future failures and help shore up vulnerable institutions? Um, Basel III is a mess, <laughs> is the, the, I think the polite way to, to, to address it. Um, it's overly complicated. It's still gameable. And I think the, the critical problem with Basel III is it just basically doesn't get capital levels high enough. Uh, it, it makes it makes it very compl it's a, it's very complicated to implement, and yet in the end the capital levels really don't go high enough under Basel III. So I don't think it's going to really make our, I don't think Basel III ha really makes our financial institution uh, system that much stronger. I would note though that we had lots of smaller financial institutions failing well before any of the current uh, re regulations went in, went, in, went in place. That there is an, we have an incremental change, but there's a fundamental problem in the economics of smaller financial institutions, which is they don't have the economies of scale necessary to compete in a lot of areas with larger financial institutions. Uh, particularly, let's say, credit cards, that's just an economy of scale business. You can't compete if you're small. And it's easy to point the finger at regulations as being the problem, but regulations are really not the key problem. The key problem is is, is one of the, the economic model. And, it, you know, we like to celebrate that we have lots of small financial institutions in the United States, but it's also notable that no other country has anywhere close to 14,000 financial institutions. Even 1,000 would be a huge number for any other country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Um, thank you, Ms. Clark. And thank our panelists. Thank you. Um, a handful of questions um, for myself. And um, Mr. Lukemeyer, uh, with, I'd actually like to put this article from last night's Wall Street Journal into the record just sort of as a benchmark for discussion. So without objection? All right. It is a hand, uh, place for the record. Um, would like to do actually a handful of quick discussions um, and make sure I'm doing some follow-up here. Uh, Ms. Sweet, you had started to discuss um, your credit union and your history of actually doing um, home loans, home mortgage loans. Yes. Um, so first, you're California, so it would be first deeds of trust. It would be or second mortgages and home equity lines of credit. Now, um, your cost structure, because a, a lot of your, your historic um, population for your credit union were grocery store workers and these – if it were a couple years ago, I walk in and I'm going to get my $350,000 loan, which for those of us in Arizona is, seems appallingly high, but you're in California. Yes. Um, what was my cost of that loan, and what happens to me today if I walk in and ask for that same loan? What's my cost? Um, a couple of years ago, that probably would have cost you around $2,500, and that would have co covered your appraisal, your uh, title search, a credit report, and all the fees that go into, all the hard costs that go into that loan. Um, today, um, that is going to cost our members about 6000 to $6,200. Many of our members are not getting those loans. Also, the qualifications, some of them don't, don't comply with the regulations and the mortgage companies or the banks, they're very tight. They're very set within their um, standards. And the cost of that loan is just astrono astronomical for these people, our members, who cannot afford that. So most of them have decided to rent. And just to make sure, um, uh, the, give me what would be an 
average or typical demographic of your clients, your customers, your actually your members, because as a credit union, mm -hmm. you know, um, who would that be? Who who are you serving on that loan? As far as their positions, um, no. most of our members have been there for many many years. So you have the elderly. Um, we know their children, their children's children, um, and, and they may have started out to be either family members of um, or worked for Safeway, either as a checker, um, a bagger, in the milk department, um, unionized workers often. Um, and the demographics now, I see a huge portion, maybe it is the bo baby boomers, um, a huge portion of senior citizens. We are also seeing a, a very large portion of minorities, California being uh, very close to Mexico. We have a, a great deal of Hispanic um, groups. We would like to serve that group more, and their needs are being underserved. Um, it is very costly, and the remittance rule is one of the things that we were going to and we're ready to implement, and we're very happy to implement yeah. to and, the... And, and none of us have actually spoken of some of those costs of, of the mechanics of, uh, as you referred to it, the remittances rule, which is, is a function of Dodd-Frank um, and what that's doing, which that may be a whole other discussion and a whole other <laughs> meeting. Um, uh, Professor Levington. Um, and, and first off, uh, you get a gold star from me on your comments about Basel III. Uh, I tried to become an expert on Basel II and a half <laughs> and Basel III, and I, it, it, partially coming from sort of a financial world, I can find places where I can run a freight train through it. Um, it but I wanted to touch two things. One, um, uh, part of your testimony is we don't actually have enough data of actual experience of regulatory environment that affecting small institutions fully enforced to truly understand them. Am I treating that fairly? I think so. Um, second of all, on your QM comment, um, my concern is that we have sort of um, passing information. Um, Mr. Mitchell's um, institution can do a non-QM loan if he keeps it on his books, but if he needs to manage certain um, capital calls or he where's the secondary market for a non QM loan where does he take those packages of loans and sell them today it's not clear that we're that we, well right now we can't we just don't know because QM isn't in place but it, uh, at this point it doesn't appear that there is a, a, non, a secondary market for non QM loans so, so that so, may change yeah so so one of our solutions here is on a positive side is do we have to come back and rebuild a more robust um, private secondary market to package and acquire or because right now it would almost be a level of misfeasance if um, Mr. Mitchell's institution produces those loans, puts them on the books, and then... Oh, he could get stuck in a liquidity bind yeah. very, very, very easily. And, and, you know, certainly the, there's the whole related issue of GSE reform. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, I'm, I'm happy Which, to... Which, God <laughs> forbid, we go there because we'll spend all... I'm day, happy to talk at length about that. I, I have another testimony, but... Um, that it's not an easy it's not an easy issue. Okay, and uh, thank you, Professor. Um, Ms. Pierce, we were actually in, in back and forth in the testimony. I'd like to try to help everyone sort of understand um, what you see from sort of your research of rules that are in effect, rules that are coming, rules that we're not sure um, because right now you know it's call your lawyer. Just as our example here of would an institution write a non-QM um, loan and put it on their books for fear of what happens tomorrow? From some of your research, what are you finding out there in sort of the command and control regulatory environment we're putting on small institutions today? Well, I think that you're right to kind of segregate it between what's happening and what's coming down the road. But I think a lot of what is the problem is that there there are mortgage regulations that are coming in place in January. People have been saying, look, we're not ready. So even if we might be able to adjust to these, we need more time, and they're not getting the, the time. So there's, there's that problem. And then there's the problem of the uncertainty about what is going to happen down the road. Um, the Consumer uh, Bureau has been focused on, on putting rules in place that they had to put in place, but what's going to come after that? I think people have a lot of uncertainty about that. And then there's just the existence of, of the, 
the regulatory cha the change in the regulators kind of state of mind and the examination change which is already affecting um, small banks and I think they're already feeling the 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 change in the way that examiners are coming in and looking at what they're doing okay thank you mr. Pierce. Um, mr. Mitchell I was I had a couple of questions for you but one um, just because I don't think we've communicated it much um, tell me about your institution here in DC um, what would be the typical demographic of the customers you serve uh, typically, it's in low and moderate income neighborhoods. Uh, we are a, a, a CDFI under the Treasury Department, uh, mostly African Americans. That's changing a lot uh, by virtue of the fact that we're doing more commercial real estate lending and the uh, demographics of Washington are, are changing. changing. Yes. Um, now, uh, also, you are the president of um, the Association of the Smaller Banks. Um, Chairman of National Bankers Association. Which makes up a lot of minority-owned, yes. specialty institutions, and, and, and just small. Minority and women-owned institutions. Um, it, it's because um, Professor uh, Leventon actually touched on, I'm curious from your chairmanship there, your presidency, um, do you see any cascade effect in sort of a Basel III environment, which was really meant for I think I truly believe more money center banks no cascading quite. down to our neighborhood and community institutions. Well, it it definitely is cascading down to to community banks like ours. Uh, but Basel III, just by the nature of the committee itself, is really for international uh, banks, the multinational mm -hmm. and international institutions, and, and and much larger institutions. If you had to talk right now and share saying. The staff difference in time. So, if it were a couple of years ago, you were making the argument that your employees were working with customers. Today, they're doing um, sort of regulatory compliance. How much of that is also them having to reach out to consultants and outside to try to find out if you're operating in the proper manner? Well, it, it depends on the employee, but I mean, if I had to average it out I, among 120 employees, I would probably say everybody is probably spending 10% more time on on regulatory and, and legislative issues. Okay. And, and that's a lot when, you, when you're talking about 120 employees. Um, Ms. Sweet, you actually touched on something very similar of um, what's happened to some of your cost structure of how many outside lawyers and consultants you're now using. Can you give us a window into what that is and that cost? I would say just on the CFPB, um, for our consultants and um, legal opinions and um, other costs that are associated with that compliance is close to $50,000. To us, that's enormous. Attorney fees is just astronomical. Um, our legal um, staff for credit unions, it's a, a legal firm for credit unions, they now have a complete segment of their attorneys dealing with regulatory compliance. Um, when I started with that firm 25 years ago, regulatory compliance was never what we would contact them for. So our, it, it is an enormous amount of money just from us that could have gone to our membership, that could have lowered those interest rates on loans and given um, higher dividends on savings accounts. Um, Ms. Sweet, as sort of a neighborhood credit union, um, if, if let's say I'm an employee at the you know, auto parts remanufacturer, Safeway, mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot of credit history. Mm -hmm. um, I would have been able to come and open my account at the neighborhood credit union and have you issue me a debit card, mm -hmm. credit card, and begin to become what many of us refer to as bankable. Um, and, and I will share to anyone who cares, this is one of my fixations ever since I was county treasurer in Maricopa, of uh, the amount of my population that was underbanked or almost unbankable because of lack of credit history, not because they were dodging a collection issue from an ex-wife. Um, in my, I know, there's always giggles on that one, but it is, it's the data. Yes. Today, is there more of a barrier for you to work with that underbanked individual? I'm trying to understand my cost structure of how do I take, in, in some communities, 20, 25% of my population 
that's underbanked, how do I make that more robust? Is this cost structure, regulatory structure we're talking about now hurting that population? It's enormously hurting the population. The time and, and resources that are spent uh, trying to either identify the intent of the regulation, that, that time and money could be spent on education. We have very young people coming into a financial institutions that have no credit whatsoever. Uh, they have never had a checking account. Um, our staff needs to take time with them and educate them, help them through the process, and help them understand what is important to get them started and what is it going to take to get that credit report because someday they may get married, have families, want the home, want the new car. Um, it is important to educate all of our, our members so that their finances is set in place. And there are glitches in that, whether it's divorce or death or something, that we're there for them. Credit unions, community banks often are the people that, pe that we are willing and able outside of a lot of these regulatory time frames to sit down with people and help them through their concerns. Thank you. And la last one, just as, uh, and I appreciate your patience. Um, professor, um, and, and this may not be the place to do it. This may be something you and I should talk about over a cup of coffee. Um, if I came to you and said you could have an A and a B regulatory environment, A is what we're doing, and B would be one where we approach Mr. Mitchell's institution and say, hey, if you hold 15% um, true equity capital, um, not operating, but equity sure. capital. Um, at that point, all we ask from you is a single touch audited financials. Because if we look back at multiple um, financial events over the last century, it was small institutions that had equity, had capital on their books, survived. Is that a, my, my father's favorite saying was, for every complicated problem, there's a simple solution. That's absolutely wrong. In this case, maybe is there actually maybe is is holding equity capital the ultimate buffer? I well, I mean, there's really no replacement for capital if you're worried about an institution solvency. And you know, the Basel rules, uh, you know, the pre the existing ones and the ones that are coming in place, yeah. both you know play well, we fun, play games with what capital we have the is. Definition problem. But if you just went with a sim with a very simple, you know, just plain common equity. You know, I don't know what the right percentage is. I can't say that it's 15 percent. But if you went with just a simple, plain, common equity level, yeah, that w I think that would be an easy way to figure out what, you know, it would be easy to implement, and if you put it high enough, that, that I think would So that, you know, there may fair. be a, an elegant solution that's sort of an A and a B. Well, it will have effects on what kind of assets financial institutions hold. Yes. Because I, we, if you're not doing risk-weighted, if, uh, if you're not doing risk-weighted assets, that's going to really change what, you know, what, what kind of lending is done. Well, well, liquidity score. So Sure. All right, um, Professor, thank you. Um, Ranking Member Clark. Mr. Mitchell, a Section 1070 of Dodd-Frank requires information gathering regarding loans made to women and minority-owned businesses. Critics have cited this section as being prohibitively expensive and an undue burden to small financial institutions. So I have a two-part question for you. How is this uh, prohibitively expensive uh, burden, and in a cost-benefit analysis, doesn't this regulation give us a better idea of how we can assist these small businesses gain capital access? I, I think it does have a benefit. Uh, however, if you look at uh, HMDA regulations, uh, it, which is pretty much the same thing as it applies to mortgages, um, the number of different uh, data points in HMDA and the number of different fields that have to have to be uh, compiled and accurately compiled, um, uh, I, many institutions even now get it wrong and the penalties are very high. So it, 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 it can be very expensive. Um, I, it's definitely very expensive. So uh, again, so then I'm going to apply another um, question to that. Uh, what would you see as probably an, an alternative to be able to get at the goal of trying to basically preserve this space 
in banking for these institutions? Well, you know, num number one, uh, in the community banking space, we care about our customers. I mean, all over the country, not just urban community banks, but rural community banks. We we're there because we know the community. We want to serve the community. We want to see the community developed. We want to provide access to capital in the community. We are part of those those communities. So we just do business differently. Um, and and I don't I don't think you see community. I don't think you see discrimination problems in community banks. That's that's really the long and short of it. Um, and I think larger institutions uh, they operate in ways that larger institutions operate. I'm not I think there is evidence that they've, they've been discriminatory, but I don't think that's necessarily true across all the board for large institutions. They do what they do, and they focus on, on larger customers and larger deals. And so the individuals fall through the cracks for one reason or another, and that's exactly why you know, they tend to standardize a lot of their, their credit processes for, for smaller businesses and individuals. I want to open up that question to uh, the other members of the panel. Um, we're just trying to figure out, uh, you know, if Section 1070 of Dodd-Frank uh, is, is prohibitively expensive and burdensome, and in, in terms of cost-benefit analysis, is, is it worth it? Um, do, and does anyone else have a, a take on that? Mr. Professor Levitin. Well, there's really, you know, if you want to, if you're concerned about discriminatory lending, if you, if you want, if you want to make sure that there really is equal credit opportunity in the United States, the only way that we can pol really police that is with ha if there's data available. The Home Mortgage Disclosure Act creates that data for mortgage lending, but there's we don't have a con we don't have comparable data for other types of lending. There's a cost to gathering that data, but the question, it's really just a question of do you think that the costs of gathering that data are worth the benefits of being able to police uh, discriminatory lending? In my mind, it's an, easy, it's, a, it's an easy question, but, you know, I, I imagine someone could disagree on that. Yeah, I would be one of those people <laughs> who would disagree. Um, you know, my concern is that data collection is it often sounds like an easy thing, but it does end up being a really big cost on the institutions that have to do it. I think the best thing that we can do in terms of preventing discriminatory lending is to make sure that we have that diversity in our financial system. And that's the concern that I have. You know, when these smaller institutions decide, I'm not, I'm not a banker anymore, I'm, a, I'm just a regulatory compliance person, so I'm going to shut, shut my institution down, that's when we're going to see people who we would want to be able to get loans not be able to get the loans that they would otherwise have gotten. Did you want to add anything this way? I do. Um, I believe that there is an area of this that we need to look at. We have, as credit unions, we have our NCUA, which is our regulatory examination um, process. And during that, there are all types of compiling of information and reporting to them on a, a quarterly basis and then annually them coming in and examining us, which takes about now through all the regulations through the years, about 90 days to get through that. So there is already in place. Um, I, I don't believe we need new regulators. I don't believe we need new regulations. We are compiling that data and have for quite some time, and it is examined already. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, part of the, the challenges uh, that, that we face as, as a legislative body is sort of uh, working from the outside in. And I, I, it, it always amazes me that, that the level of consultation, in other words, uh, living vicariously through institutions like yours, that ought to take place so that we have informed um, an informed process. Um, it, it doesn't take place often enough. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, um, you know, just just to share with, with colleagues that it, it, I think it, it benefits us in the long run. Um, th these one-size-fits-all fits, fits all, uh, solutions, the, the unintended consequences oftentimes uh, are, are, uh, are not really um, not worth it. Uh, even if there's the, the fear that these regulations will be burdensome and it um, 
uh, shocks the culture of the institutions that we're we're trying to preserve, then we're defeating the purpose uh, that, that that we're all seeking. So I, I I mean I'm rambling right now, but I I, I it, it just amazes me that we wouldn't have uh, done an an, an, an a fair um, analysis and have a strong and robust conversation with. Uh, the diversity of institutions that we're trying to regulate here, so that uh, so that we don't um, create a, a crisis um, by trying to avert a crisis. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Clark. Um, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would certainly like to associate myself with the comments Ms. Clark just made. I do believe that. Uh, that uh, we need to take a very close look at this uh, th at this law, Mr. Mitchell. Something you said earlier uh, piqued my curiosity. You were talking about discriminatory lending practices, and and you indicated, I think, that the standardization of lending criteria by big banks led to some of that. Is that right? Um, well, no, not necessarily. Uh, I, I just think that there was discrimination involved in, with some of the larger institutions. I, what the point I was trying to make is that community banks, by our nature, is we do a lot of creative uh, personalization uh, in trying to in trying to make loans. Um, and and, the, and why the, do you do that? Why do you have to do creative personalization? Because you know, I think we we more so want to make loans than we want to decline them. And and doesn't this law? <laughs> in an effort to standardize these loans, doesn't it take away your ability to do exactly Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and that disproportionately affects who? Low and moderate income individuals. Right. So what we're doing is we're actually probably expanding income disparity, expanding access to capital, mm -hmm. expanding disparities in access to capital with this law. That's true. And isn't this exactly the opposite of what this law was supposed to do? I believe so. Okay. Uh, I, I, this, I think this law is, is fundamentally flawed, and, and I, perhaps more so than it, it, I think it threatens our economy perhaps more than most, uh, because I believe uh, America is built on innovation and competitiveness, and we compete with people around the world, not just in this country, and everybody is trying to compete, and we, we succeed if we're better by small degrees. It's not vast things, it's small degrees. And I think that this law m makes us less competitive. One of the big, one of the big things that uh, uh, America has had as an advantage is access to capital. And this law decreases our access to capital. Uh, a disproportionate amount of the jobs in this country are created by small businesses. That's right. And a disproportionate amount of those jobs are created by startup businesses. Now, when you're looking to make a loan, I'm going to go to Mrs. Pierce now because I hadn't picked on you yet. <laughs> uh, do you think when a small bank is looking to make a loan to a small business a startup, is it going to be easier or more complicated under Dodd-Frank? Um, certainly more complicated. Um, it, it is definitely more complicated. The of course, I mean, the, the regulators are coming and they're looking more closely. And so what I had one small banker say to me is, look, I can know that a business is going to pay back a loan, but I won't make that loan because I know that I'm going to have to explain it to a regulator later. Mm -hmm. And I won't be able to because I won't be able to say the, the regulator is not going to meet the small businessman and is not going to know the same things I know about that person. And so it's impossible to justify it. So I just won't do it. All right, and it, you know, I guess this is not an area where you're really qualified. But in small businesses, the jobs that are created are those jobs. Do you think going to, to higher income people or lower income people? Well, you're right to say that I'm probably not qualified to answer that. But my my guess is that those would mostly be uh, lower income people. So that's another aspect of this of this law that attacks the middle class. Yeah, I mean, when you put constraints on the ability of people to get capital, it has it has follow-on effects in the economy. All right. Um, uh, if you look at areas where America has, you know, succeeded in competing uh, worldwide, I mean, and we have for decades, but if you look at our infrastructure, which is 
other countries are coming up and our interest our infrastructure i would argue was declining or perhaps crumbling when you look at our educational system certainly other countries have lifted themselves and perhaps we've been stagnant or fallen behind and now you look at our access to capital this is just one more area where we're making this country less competitive i think this law is is uh... that federal regulatory environment does more to stifle innovation and job creation than anything else and i think this is a huge uh, addition to the federal regulatory environment and uh, i certainly think we need to rethink the entire law but if not that as much of it as we can thank you very much sorry mr rice uh, mr lukemeyer <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the deference to allow me to be here today and to participate in this hearing, and certainly appreciate everybody's uh, uh, great testimony. I just have a few comments. Uh, I know, Ms. Hester, in your um, testimony this morning, your written testimony, you make the comment that one of every two dollars lent to small businesses comes from community banks. And I think that's a very, very significant figure. I think it's important that we understand that uh, how, what the, the role that the banks play in their communities that they're in. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit at length here uh, in the last couple of minutes, but I think it needs to be reinforced that this is a tremendous role that they have. They are the hands-on, if you will, institutions within the communities that they serve. Um, I know uh, Mr. Mitchell made the comment a few minutes ago about, uh, and I, I noticed in your testimony also, you may comment to the effect that uh, the small uh, community banks tailor the products to fit their individual needs. And I thought Mr. Mitchell did a good job explaining that they have that ability to do that, uh, where the big banks sometimes, and that's where they get themselves in compliance problems, have a standardized stuff, uh, way of looking at things, and if it doesn't fit it, you don't get the loan, where the, the other institutions seem to be able to make those uh, adjustments on the fly. Would you like to come in on that just a little bit more and elaborate? I know you've met a little bit just, just now, but I think it's important to re reinforce that point. Um, certainly, I think that, that that's one of the beauties of the system that we have. I mean, there's nothing wrong if a big bank wants to make only standardized loans. That's fine, as long as we have a system that allows these smaller institutions to come in and fill the gap. Um, and that's the, that's the situation that we have had. But I think the, the more that you put in a regulatory framework that's designed with these big banks in mind, you leave out the smaller institutions and what we're seeing in the survey that, that the Mercatus Center conducted is that a lot of people are saying, we're just going to try to stay away from the consumer business altogether because it's, it's, it's too dangerous for us to be there. So while we'd like to make those loans, we just won't make them anymore. Did you see in your survey that uh, there was an intimidation factor by the regulators with regards to how, the, how punitive they are sometimes with the way that they uh, enforce the rules? Yeah, I think one of the comments um, that sort of struck me was that you can be trying to do everything right and you make a mistake and the consequences are so high of that mistake. Um, and, and so it's just because there's so many rules to keep track of, it's really difficult to stay on the right side of the line. I think this is uh, one of the comments that was made and I had a long discussion with the FDIC uh, chairman with regards to this. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, you made comment in your, in your uh, uh, testimony to the, uh, the FDIC study last fall. Uh, and, and you made a comment a minute ago with regards to Humda. This has been a just a nightmare for the institutions to comply with. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Sweet made comment about it a minute ago as well. What what's been your experience with regards to regulators and Humda? I mean, you inadvertently can not. This is this is but all this is for those who don't know what's going on is this box checking. You check a box to make sure that you 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 told the individual this statement. You handed them this piece of paper. You make sure that the and, and you go down the list with about 25 different things. And if you miss one box, the whole loan the whole loan is considered uh, in violation versus one box that you fail to check. What's your experience with that? Well, first of all, I think it, the Humda could be simplified, and and I think if there are small business reporting requirements, they need to be they need to be. Um, uh, something that can be complied with and be relatively simple to achieve the objectives with not not much expense. But with respect to Humda, I speak to bankers all the time, and all bankers have problems with Humda because it is a lot of box checking. And if you and if you if you make a mistake with with one field, you know there could be 16 or 20 different fields just for one loan. 
And if you make a mistake with one field, you made a mistake with for that that entire that entire loan. Um, we are administratively uh, pretty well run when it comes to compliance, and we continue to struggle with Humda. Uh, from my experience uh, in talking with the community bankers, you're not alone. It seems like everybody, uh, and, and this is something that I've talked with the regulars about, is having some deference here with regards to uh, trying to comply with all these things. Um, and I'll give you a quick example. Whenever we had, uh, in, in Missouri, uh, over, a, I think, about a two, two-and-a-half-year period, the FDIC had civil monthly penalties for uh, 180 violations, I think 160 to 180 violations. Uh, and during that same period of time, the Fed and Comptroll had a total, I think, of five. So we had a long discussion at FDIC and said, look, what's going on here? Now, I used to be a regulator myself. This is not the way that this is supposed to be enforced. Tell us what's going on. I think they've, they've tried to take a look at this, but I think the point I'm trying to make is there seems to be an intimidation factor sometimes also with regulators. It makes it very difficult for uh, those community banks to exist because they don't have the power to fight back. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, there's no question about it. Thank you. Uh, again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your deference and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Luke Meyer, it was fun having you on the committee with your background. Um, uh, Ms. Clark, I, we okay to close up? Um, I am going to share just uh, the old danger of when they hand me a microphone and there's no clock on me. It, this is a small business oversight subcommittee. But the reality for all of you, what you do um, whether it be you know, helping organize the regulatory environment as a community banker, as a community credit union, as someone trying to work on public policy, um, the access to capital is the lubricant that runs this, this engine of our economy. And we spend a lot of time talking about you as small businesses and your clients and the cost of the clients. But there's that next tier out, and that is when your clients are also those small businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, the person coming in trying to buy a piece of real estate and the cascade effect that has or trying to find access to capital. Um, uh, Ranking Member Clark and I were just kibitzing a bit on, you know, some of us have ideas of if the flexibility for our small community banks and, and um, neighborhood credit unions to be able to also be the alternative to a check cashing store <laughs> or a title loan or those things. But... That's a very different view in a regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be a way to create lots of competition, lots of access to capital for things that grow our economy. And it, it's, it's helping the, that part of our population that's underbanked, but also to the person that's starting a business. And, it, it, you know, for many of us, we keep saying access to capital is going to be very different by the end of this decade if we don't screw it up. But yet I see what's coming out of the regulatory environment on equity crowdfunding, and it breaks my heart because this egalitarian idea is going to be crushed if, if the rule set moves forward the way it is. And I see that happening in our community banks and our credit unions of you're just going to move up the food chain in credit quality and income and status, and once again, we're going to leave more and more of our brothers and sisters out there underbanked and left, mm -hmm. left in the cold. Um, it, it, so we, I appreciate this discussion. It's a big discussion, and my fear is we don't spend enough time trying to also come up with a mechanical solution mm -hmm. um, because there's also a lot of folklore about what we went through in 2008, uh, what caused the cascade. Um, we, we discuss of community banks, well, if community banks' real estate portfolios hadn't collapsed in value, how many of them would be here today? And was that from their poor underwriting, or was it at the top of the pyramid, the collapse that came down, you know, through the, you know, through much larger institutions? So, you know, it, there's lots of data and a lot of bad data out there that we make these decisions on. So as we wrap up today, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to get... All right. It, <laughs> I think I make um, senior staff nervous when I go off script um, l like that. But um, uh, w I, with that, uh, I ask unanimous consent 
that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Also, um, as witnesses, do be prepared. There may be some questions that come your way and that we will ask you to respond to. And without objection, um, this hearing is adjourned.